Good morning. Uh, welcome to Jerome Christian Church. Uh, my name is Jonathan Green. I'm the youth minister here. I got a couple announcements for you guys. Uh, one is most of them are the same as last week. So if you remember from last week, then you can stop paying attention now. But um, <laughs> we got a week of camp for junior hires, sixth through eighth grade, coming up next Sunday. And uh, we're still looking for some uh, some adult helpers. So if you are over the age of 18 and you want to come help at Week of Camp, you get uh, free food, so that's cool. And uh, you get a place to stay, so that's good too. Uh, a bed, a warm, a very warm bed to sleep in. Um, but you can bring a fan too, so that's fine. Uh, so if you want to come and do that, please talk to me afterwards. Uh, we have a junior high week coming up next week, and then the week after that we have a two-night camp with Ashley. Uh, it's uh, for second and third graders, so if you uh, can't do my week, then come and do her week. Uh, we're mostly looking for guys to come help. We do need a couple more ladies, but uh, mostly guys. So if you're over the age of 18 and you are uh, a male, then come talk to us. Uh, also, we have these flyers over here on the tables. One's over here and one's over there. And uh, they are open house flyers. We've got some seniors that have graduated this year. And so uh, these have all the dates. There's a bunch of them coming up this weekend. So grab yourself a flyer so that you can uh, be able to support our seniors that are graduating. Uh, next week, we will have Senior Sunday. Uh, we'll be honoring the seniors during our services next week. And um, finally, today, uh, Ashley has uh, the, the, for families, they can go to the Lewis's house. That's Kyle Lewis. He's over here playing the keys. Okay, you can go to his house. Uh, he's got a pool there, so that's cool. And uh, swimming for uh, kids that are from first to fifth grade, and it's for, fa for families to come. So you can't just leave your kids and then disappear. You've got to come and hang out with us. Um, so those are all the announcements I have for today. Would you guys all please uh, stand up, and we can pray together and get started with our worship. Uh, Heavenly Father, God, uh, we, we thank you for this place where we can come and worship you. God, I pray that our worship will be a blessing to you. God, I pray for all of our, our upcoming events, uh, our camps, God, that uh, your Holy Spirit would be there and that those would be a big blessing on all the students who are able to go and a blessing on the adults that are able to help. Uh, God, I pray for all of our seniors that have graduated. I pray uh, for everybody who's affected by the coronavirus right now, God. And God, uh, we just, we just want to come before you right now and praise your name. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you all here this morning. It's good to have you here. If you're a visitor, welcome. We're glad you're here with us today. We just want to lift our voices up this morning. We want to praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So join with us, lift your voices with us, and let's give him the glory he deserves.
love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. And your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am.
I don't know. I don't know if it was just because we have a few more numbers here this morning or what, but that is the first time in a long time that um, I just didn't sing and heard the voices on that last song, and I've missed that. I missed that a lot. I didn't hear it when Phil was leading, but the song Amanda led, I did hear, so I don't know if there's something to be said for that. But we, uh, yeah, you're welcome. Um, we've been doing this series, we called it Never Again, and the idea that we're not going to go back to the way our lives were before God gave us this interruption these last few months to kind of reset things. I was thinking as I was preparing this message several years ago, I was flying out to Massachusetts uh, for a, a little speaking thing that I had going on. So I'm on the plane out to Massachusetts, and I'm sitting next to two guys. They were high school-aged guys that were right next to me. And um, I was listening to a CD on my Discman. Do you remember the Discman that you would have? That you would put a CD in. It was like, and you'd had the headphones. I was listening to a CD on that, and the CD ended, so I went to switch it. And I reached in my bag, and I was switching the CDs, and the guy next to me, this high school punk, says, whoa, and he was looking at me, like watching what I was doing. He said, can I see that? And I brought the discman out and I showed it to him and he hits the guy next to him. He's like, look at this thing. And I realized then they were mocking me for still having a discman and not having the little MP3 player and all of that stuff. And so they were like, well, why are you still using one of these? And so I didn't know what to do in that situation. I should have realized since I'm flying to Massachusetts, they're probably Patriots fans, which means they're not worth having conversation with. But anyway, I think I made up something like, oh, I like the sound quality better on these or something like that. And they were like, oh, and they handed it back to me. It reminded me of when I was in high school. I was the last of my friend group to transfer from cassettes to CDs. I was still stuck on the cassettes, and I will never forget uh, riding the basketball, uh, freshman basketball bus to games, and I'd be listening to my Walkman, and Steiner, Jeff Steiner, was my best friend in high school, just mocking the snot out of me for, oh, let's hit rewind, let's wait two minutes for the next song, here we go. I just hated that kid so much, but anyway... I'm thinking about all this stuff and the technology and the way that it has changed over the course of the last few years. I will say, and I hope that those of you who are older will back me up, we had different technology, but technology did not dominate our lives the way that it does today. I think that young people maybe can't even understand that it really wasn't that huge of a deal if you were still stuck on cassettes and didn't make the, I always told Steiner and all of them, you know, one day they're going to find out that CDs cause cancer and this guy with his cassettes is going to get the last laugh. It's not panning out that way, but nonetheless, it wasn't as big of a deal. I remember when I went to Indiana Wesleyan, I went to, uh, we, we lived in Carmen Hall my freshman year. Now, Carmen Hall, after my freshman year, they transferred and changed into a, a woman's dorm, which I've reasoned that it's because when I lived there, they knew that they had reached the peak of masculinity and there was no way they were ever going to top that so then they made it a, a girl's dorm but it, that was a cutting edge dorm down the hallway from our room there was a computer lab that you could go to and they had these computers that got online and they didn't have the <laughs> that sound you remember when you would be dialing up and you could surf the way it was it was amazing I think back on my college years and I'm not making this up I received more letters through my four years of college, then I got emails from people. That's kind of crazy to think about because my college years weren't that long ago. I had an emergency cell phone that my mother made me take with me. I didn't want it. It was her cell phone, and she, like, forced it on me. And I, I think about that now to imagine a conversation where a parent is trying to force a cell phone onto their child who is saying, I don't want you to know where I am at all times of the day. I don't want you to be able to contact me. Today, it's the precise opposite of that. The internet was absurdly slow. Even my first year of teaching, I remember September 11th was my first month in the classroom. And Dave Durkis came next door to tell me about what had happened. He was like, have you heard? I, no, I haven't heard. He said, get on the internet. But do you remember when the pictures used to load and it would be the top little portion and then five minutes later it would be the next? So I'm watching MSNBC.com as it's unfolding that picture and I'm seeing the towers with the second plane hitting. That's how I found out about September 11th. Technology was totally different then than what it is today. 
I want to preface this all by saying, just like last week when I was talking about faithful parenting, some of you who have already faithfully parented maybe felt like, well, this sermon isn't hitting and it's not landing. I tried to stress to you, you still know people who are parenting, who are caught up in all of this, and you can express these principles. I'm aware that there are those of you here that don't get the attraction with the gadgets, It's not your thing. You're not into it at all, or you've tried and you've become exhausted trying to keep up with it all, and you've just thrown in the towel. You're done with trying to keep up with technology. I get that, and honestly, ask Denny Bagley, by the time I'm done with this sermon, many of the things that I will reference will already be out of date by the time that this sermon ends. I'm aware of all of that, and I'm also aware that there's a concern when I talk about this that we're going to become as Christians like the Ludites. I think that there's this, you know the Ludites in the 18th, 19th century, 1800s, these were the people that rebelled against all the textile mills in England, and they would destroy all the textile equipment. They believed technology was a weapon of the devil that was destroying people's lives and livelihoods. And I think there's an impulse for Christians to do the same thing. To look at cell phone technology and iPads and it's destroying the home and it's destroying what God intends. I'm going to tell you that that the Ludites are not people who are worth mimicking. I don't think it's biblical what they believed, what they did, and not for us either. Here's the truth, and you may not like this, but the old days are gone. The old days are not coming back. And to be honest, the old days probably weren't that great to begin with. It's nostalgia in our mind that tells us that those times were purer and better Whereas if we went back and actually lived them, we would find people saying the same thing about the times that came before them. That's the reality that you and I face today. And let's acknowledge that there are immense benefits to this age that we're living in now. How do I know that? Do you realize that people used to die to get their hands on a copy of the Christian scriptures? I mean, they would have done anything to have access to it. You have access not only to a Bible on your phone wherever you go, but every version of the Bible that's out there, every commentary and work of theology, one touch of it, and you've got it right there with you. What an amazing blessing that is. I know that I pick on people that do this because I like the physical copy of the Bible, but don't overlook the power of having that at your fingertips. Also, Google Maps, we were just in Nevada. My family was this last week. It was a brilliant decision to go to Nevada in the summer. Addie rolled the window down to get some fresh air. It was 113 degrees outside. We almost all suffocated in the car when she cracked the window. But anyway, we rented a boat and went out on Lake Mead. I don't know if you've ever been out on a lake that I know like Mississinawa and some of those, but like Lake Mead is huge and it's got all these inlets and everything. Do you know the benefit of being able to bloop, drop a marker right where your dock is and then you can go out wherever you want to on the lake and then pull it up on your phone and be able to navigate back to where you came from. You don't have to lay breadcrumbs that can get swept away by the waves. That's an incredible benefit. I remember growing up, remember MapQuest? Oh, my dad loved MapQuest. They printed off the directions and he put it in this little plastic sleeve. We took a family vacation to Florida and we followed dad's MapQuest. This is the thing that said you turn left after three barns after you pass the old Wilson Road. Well, Wilson Road sign has been blown down by the storm that came through last week. Had no idea. We got so lost in Tennessee on that trip. It added 13 days to our family vacation. Okay, Google Maps is an incredible blessing. It's a wonderful thing. Um, I remember doing a, a speaking at an event, and afterwards they went through all of their dry statistics and, and money from the year before, and Notre Dame was on. And I was able to keep my phone underneath the table as they're going through all of the boring stuff and watch the game, or at least watch the scores unfold. That's an incredible blessing. I can keep in contact with my loved ones wherever I want to go, wherever I want to be. These are wonderful blessings that we have. But there are some things that are dangerous about technology as well especially given this topic that we're talking about, about the domination of our time and our schedules. And we have to be aware of that. Biblically-minded people are going to view technology through a biblical lens, through a godly lens, through the lens of Scripture. You know how we always talk about, as Christians, we take every thought we have and we make it obedient to the will of Christ? We do the same thing with technology. We take all of these gadgets and make their use obedient to the will of Christ. That means we identify the threats of sin that come with them and we know how to neutralize them. We know how to defeat them. That's vitally important for us as believers. Here's one of the threats that we face with all the technology is addiction. It is an addicting thing. Contextually, if you read this in scripture, Paul is talking about sexual addictions 
But take the Christian ethic that he is speaking to and apply it to what we're talking about. He writes, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be, look at this word, mastered by anything. And that's my question. Are we mastered by technology? Are our lives completely consumed in them? Again, for some of you, you you say, no, I'm not mastered by tech. But there are some of us who our lives are completely overwhelmed and run and governed by technology. Let me ask you, could you go a day without Facebook? For some of you, absolutely, you believe Facebook is Satan incarnate or, or it's the Antichrist. What about Twitter? Could you go a day without Twitter? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know if I could. I know that's embarrassing for me to say, but that's how I get my news. How I know what's going on in the world, I check my Twitter feed. Because news, news uh, uh, corporations will post uh, events on Twitter, and that's how I'll see. And I'll see how people are responding to it. Could you go a day without it? Could you go an afternoon without your phone? Could you honestly go an afternoon without your phone? Could you go two days without emails? And I know younger kids aren't really onto the email thing anymore, but for some of us, that's how we do business. It's how we do work. Even if your boss told you to do it and you were guaranteed somehow that there would be no emergencies, could you honestly separate yourself from the screen? Could you do it? Now, half of you maybe say yes, but even that half, I guarantee you, You are in close contact with people who would struggle immensely with doing any of this. We need these biblical principles. Even when we want to, many of us can't step away even for a few hours. I want you to think about the hallmarks of any addiction, whether it's smoking, it's drinking, it's pornography. Think about any addiction that's out there and what does it do? It causes dependency and craving. It causes your habits to change. It causes constantly thinking about it and suffering relationships as a result. Technology? Does it do any of those things? Constantly needing to know what's going on in the world and following the world events? Do my habits change? The way that I, I navigate my day, does it change and alter because of my addictions? I can tell you that's true. Every morning when I get up and I have my breakfast and I go to the toilet, I'm checking my Twitter feed. I bet you wanted to know that. I'm wanting to know what happened the night before. That's, that's a habit now that I have. Every night before I go to bed, I check to see what's going on. I scroll through my Instagram to see people's pictures from the day. Am I constantly thinking about it? Do I need to know well, what, how many people have been diagnosed with coronavirus in the last two hours? I need to know that. What is the trend looking like? What is the comparison between cases and deaths? Is it true that deaths are plummeting while cases are rising because we're doing more testing? Or is this, I find myself constantly thinking about that. Are relationships suffering? Can you drive to Indianapolis without being on your phone? Do we honestly struggle now to talk while we're driving because we're taking advantage of that time to catch up on the news or to send emails because we've got our phone with us? This is what I'm talking about. Those are the hallmarks of addiction. I want to read to you from a recent article that really spoke to me, and it spoke to me because I struggle with this. The guy wrote, I'm unable to focus on anything in a deep or detailed manner. Maybe medication would help, but I'm acutely aware of what my problem stems from. The only thing my mind can do, in fact, the only thing it wants to do, is plug back into the frenzy of online information. That's me. I struggle to think critically about stuff because I'm constantly wanting to know what's happening now. What is this person saying? What is that person saying? What's the latest news that's taking place? This author in this article goes on and he acknowledges himself that the happiest and most fulfilled times of my life have all involved a prolonged separation from the internet. He knows that this is so much more pleasing and fulfilling, and yet he's constantly drawn back to this over here. That's what addiction is. He is simply overcome by it. And I think many of us are overcome by it as well. And I sit there and I look at those statements, and that word right there sticks out at me. Why? Look at what the Apostle Peter wrote. For people are slaves to whatever has overcome them. Have I become a slave to technology? I am to be a slave to Christ. That is where my mind and my heart should be set. And yet, is he dominating my existence or is my phone dominating my existence? Another threat that we face is not just addiction, but it's apathy. What do I mean by apathy? I'm not just talking about laziness. This is an active spiritual indifference, spiritual level indifference that we have to the world around us. This is what happens. We feel like we're busy 
even as we're lifeless. We're not doing anything. We're sitting and we're scrolling and we're looking and we're posting and we're liking and we're retweeting and we're, we're commenting. But we aren't contributing anything to society around us whatsoever. It manifests when, when we're always engaged with our thumbs, but never with our minds, never with our hearts. We are not actively working in the communities where God has planted us because we're too busy in a virtual online community where we're having no impact whatsoever. Maybe we've convinced ourselves that we are, but, but we're not. It's the polar opposite of a Christian mind. Look again what Peter writes. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I look at that, and I'm going to tell you that if you are constantly trafficking and swimming in the shallow waters of social media, I don't think your mind is being prepared for action. I don't think it is. I think you are being sucked into a world where you will have no impact for the kingdom of God. Remember what we talked about the very first week? That, that we're busy here and there, or here and there. All the while, what's most important is slipping away from us. Here's another threat. We're never alone. We are never alone. And you say, what do you mean that that's a threat? I don't mean that we're on the grid. There are some of you that are freaked out about being on the grid, and you want to live as far away from technology as possible because you know that the new world order is watching you from above. You know that all of these, and I'm not overly worked up. Maybe I should be, but I'm not. Although, I will say this, and maybe you've had an experience like, like this. I went to Lowe's the other day, and the reason I went, I dropped um, pipes down into my two pool returns, so the little skimmer baskets that collect all the crud, they don't fit down into the hole because I put pipes down in there for a different reason. So I had to MacGyver this thing which always works out well when, when I do that. So what I'm looking for this is like um, pliable plastic. And I go to Lowe's and I find these weird things called aqua baskets. I guess you put a plant in them and you can hang them in water. I don't know, but they, anyway. So I buy a couple aqua baskets. I'd never seen these things before. Take them home, cut them up, put them in the pool returns. Works exactly like I wanted them to do. Never thought anything else about it. That night, I lay down in bed, my typical routine. I start scrolling through Instagram, and after about five or six pictures, it'll put up a, an ad for you. And I know that it's based off of what I've looked at on my phone, that it'll, but all of a sudden, five or six pictures in, I start getting all kinds of ads for aqua baskets. I never looked up aqua baskets on my phone. I never knew what an aqua basket was. And it dawned on me, somehow, the ghost of Steve Jobs or Bill Gates is watching from above. He knew that my credit card had purchased aqua baskets. It, it, it matched my credit card to my phone, and they know me. They know all about me. Freak me out. Anyway, so maybe there is something to this thing about being on the grid, but that's not what I'm talking about, the threat of never being alone. Our desire to never be alone, to constantly be surrounded by the busyness and the happenings of this world, it is dangerous for our souls. I'm a firm believer that you can learn from the teaching and the instruction of Scripture, as well as the examples that we see in Scripture. Look at Jesus. Jesus, an incredibly busy guy. He's not a loner, and yet Jesus regularly sought alone time. Did he? Take a look back at his life. When he went to prepare for work, after his baptism, before he began his public ministry, he took 40 days off by himself to prepare. You can look it up in scripture if you don't trust me on this. Even after his work, to recover from work, look at what Jesus tells the 12. They get back from ministry and he tells them, you need to separate yourself from people in order to rest. Take time alone to work through grief. When he learned that his cousin, John the Baptist, had lost his head, Jesus separated himself from people to work through his grief that he was experiencing. Jesus sought alone time before he made important decisions. Right before he selects his 12, what does he do the whole night before? He spends it in prayer. Jesus sought alone time. In times of crisis, he's facing the emotional agony. He knows his crucifixion is upcoming. He separates himself at the Mount of Olives from even his disciples, and he spends time alone in prayer. And speaking of that, to focus on prayer, throughout his ministry, Jesus is always separating himself from the busyness of life to seek the Father and his will. That's my question. Do we, the times that we are constantly on our phones, those quiet moments, are we capable of seeking God's face, or are we consumed with the happenings and the busyness of this world? There's a, seriously, I just, I just, 
This child is speaking to our problem and is, I'm so sorry. Quit looking at her. It's only making it worse. I guess me calling it out probably makes it even worse. Brent, I blame you for all of that. Anyway, Hamlet's Blackberry. Hamlet's Blackberry. I don't know if you've ever read this book or not. Um, I'm sure you haven't. It's a tiny little online book that you can read. It's a fascinating, fascinating account of what I'm talking about. In it, it's a weird story to try to explain. William Powers details this. He says, it's like all of us are in a room and we're standing shoulder to shoulder. So imagine being in this giant room and you're shoulder to shoulder with people. And we're kind of making our way through the room and that's our life. And every so often somebody will come up and will tap us on the shoulder and we'll turn and we'll start talking to them and they're talking about something interesting. And then while we're talking to them, somebody else taps us and we turn and then they engage us with some other conversation. And then somebody else taps us and we turn around and we start talking to them. And for a while we like it because it's constantly stimulating our minds and we're into the conversation. But then after a while it becomes a little obnoxious because they're tapping us when we're eating, they're tapping us when we're on dates, they're tapping us when we're trying to sleep. They're tapping us when we're going to the bathroom and we can't get any time away for ourselves. We're constantly being bombarded with information and we want escape. And so in the story, the person finds the escape. They find the door, but they look out and they see the quiet emptiness that's out there and they hesitate. They hesitate because they think to themselves, well, I want to go. I want to get away from this, but what am I going to do if I go out there into the quietness? How am I going to occupy my mind? I'm going to miss the conversation. I'm going to miss all of these things. And then you realize the problem isn't the inability to escape. It's the lack of desire to escape. We don't really want to leave it. How are we going to pass the time if we don't have this? It's the Hotel California is what it is. You can check out any time you want, but you can't ever leave. You know that better than some hymns. You heathens. (laughs) Heathens. Anyway, but notice again the real danger there. We don't want to leave this life that we're living. We prefer the endless noise over the deafening silence. That's what we've become. We choose the busyness as a way of avoiding the actual depth that would come from quiet time. We prefer the trivia, trivial uh, and the distracting. That's what we want. So, how do Christians respond? If we know that this is the problem... We see it through the lens of Scripture. Let me offer a simple solution that isn't so simple. How about we apply the weight of Christian theology, theology that we have always known, theology that we have always learned, apply the weight of Christian theology to these very problems. What do I mean? Well, what is Christian theology? Here's Christian theology. For in him... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things on earth were created through him and for him. That's Christian theology. All right? So what does that tell us? All things were created through him. There is nothing inherently evil about man-made creations. Nothing inherently evil about a cell phone. Nothing inherently evil about a computer or an iPad. All things were created through him. The genius of man did not separate himself from God's brilliance and somehow create something on his own. All things created through him and all things are created for him. Meaning what? All things that we create as human beings can be tools for our flourishing and for God's glory. Apply the weight of Christian theology to your technology. Do you use it in a way that brings God glory? That's one way. How about another principle of Christian theology? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance, in accordance with his pleasure and his will. We, you and I, were chosen before time began by a God who is not bound by time. And remember what else we learn, that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. We serve a God who operates completely separate from a world of deadlines and pressures that we face. If we are made in his image, you and I cannot be sucked into all of these fads and trends that are completely motivated by deadlines and pressures of this world. We are to be different. Apply the weight of Christian theology to our problem. This is theological truth, is it not? That the world became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is that talking about? Jesus. Please don't miss this. 
I really, if there's one point I want you to hear in this message, it's this right here. So please tune in. God could have reached you and I. He could have reached humanity in a million different ways. He could have written something in the sky. He could have put it in the sand on the seashore. He could have sent us all private messages. God could have reached us any way he wanted. A million different options. And how did the God of eternity reach out to humanity? How did he reach out to save humanity? He did it through physical presence. God could have reached humanity in any way. And he chose physical flesh and blood relationship. Apply the weight of Christian theology to our problem and understand that you and I must refuse to accept virtual encounters as an adequate replacement for flesh and blood relationships. You want to impact the, the world for the kingdom of God? Stop exchanging flesh and blood relationships for fake ones that don't really exist online. Stop it. This is how God impacted the world. And this is how God will continue to impact the world, through flesh and blood relationships. Apply the weight of Christian theology. We read this in the first chapter of Genesis. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. And then we read in 1 John that we should be called children of God. That is who we are. We are children of God. We are beings who bear the image of the creator of the universe, being whose, beings whose identity is being children of God, in that you will not turn to the internet. You will not turn to online communities and mobs to give you your sense of importance, your sense of value, your sense of worthiness, or the sense that you are loved. Where does that come from? It comes from the truth that you are a child of the God of the, God of the universe. That's Christian theology. Stop turning to online encounters to provide those things for you. Now, if I do, you know this one. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. We all know this experience, right? This is Christian theology. What is Paul teaching? The presence of indwelling sin. You and I need to know the presence of indwelling sin and how it will manifest when we go online. What do I mean by that? Sexual idolatry. We know that that's a temptation online, don't we? David happened by chance to see Bathsheba bathing on the roof and it led him into premeditated adultery and murder. Follow me. He saw her by chance on the roof. There are a million different Bathshebas at the touch of one finger on a phone. Sexual idolatry is real. Political idolatry is real. We get online and we join with others who share our political beliefs and we demonize those who don't share our beliefs. We sever relationships. We cause all kinds of heartaches because we've made politics into an idol. And it's so prevalent online. Sports idolatry. We become so obsessed with what's happening in our sports league. That's all we follow. It's all we pay attention to. The sports writers that cover our events. Again, some of you maybe don't experience this. Others of you could tell me every statistic because you follow it constantly. It becomes an idol. Same thing with entertainment. What's the latest news? Who's breaking up with whom? Whose relationship is doing what? All of these things. You take them all. Collectively... This is all sucking away the time that you and I should be spending, remember what we talked about two weeks ago, on mission. Jesus said, there's all this good stuff I could do, this is why I was sent. This stuff isn't even good stuff, and yet it dominates so much of our time because it becomes an addiction, and it sucks us away from being on mission. And then there's, there's this, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sin. What is this Christian theology right here? We're fallen creatures. And as fallen creatures, you need, we need to know the limits of, of our condition. And what are those limits? If you know them, it will temper your online obsessions. And please know, I'm not speaking from the voice of wisdom that has accomplished this yet. I need to. I need to learn this principle. We cannot have meaningful relationships with thousands of people that we encounter online. We cannot really keep up on all that is happening in the world just because we have access to a flood of information online. Here's the truth. 
you cannot actually be here where God has placed you and there in a virtual world where you're sucked into all kinds of stuff. You can't be both places at once. If you are choosing to be there, then you are omitting the placement where God has given you. You're not paying attention to where you are. Here is the truth. We are not omnipresent. We're not. We are not omni-informed. You can't know every side of every issue of everything that is happening in the world. We are not omnicompetent. You are not capable of, of taking all of the information and synthesizing it and making sense of all that's going on in the world. And you were never intended to be. Only God is these things. And our efforts to pretend otherwise, which happen way too often, they're not going to end well for us. Embrace your finite and your limited nature. I will tell you, when we do, that's when we're free. When you understand our limited nature, who God has made us to be, and understand his omnipresence, his omniscience, his power, and our right to submit to it and be guided by him, that's when you're free. Father, I pray for freedom from this addiction for every single one of us. I pray for recommitted hearts to serving where you have placed us, not to become sucked into virtual encounters, not to be dominated by a virtual schedule, not to be consumed in the constant noise and busyness of world events that we have no control over. Father, I pray that we would be mindful of the times and know what we should do but that we would turn to you for that wisdom, not online commentaries, not being governed by gadgets. Father, may we recommit our hearts to your leading, your prompting. We pray all this in the name above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ, and everyone said, amen. amen. Would you all uh, please stand up? And uh, right now we are going to have a song of invitation. If um, at this time you want to make a decision uh, to become baptized and uh, join the family of God. Or if you want to place your membership, you guys can come forward at this time. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the soul now to stand. You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders. My soul And what can I do but offer this heart, oh God, completely to you?
If you're uh, visiting with us for the first time, we have these uh, communion cups. There's two layers to it. There's a clear layer on top to get to the bread, and then you can peel the rest back to get to the juice. I have a, I have a confession to make. And it's, uh, it's one that has hung with me for quite some time. And the, the, the fact is, I'm cheap. <laughs> I, I say it's a hereditary gene. I got it from my dad. And I've seen in my son that it's probably being passed on to him as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm cheap. So what do I mean by that? I... Uh, I don't like to pay for things that I think I can fix myself. Um, the, there's a lot of experts out there. They charge a lot of money for things to be repaired and fixed. And I, I, I currently drive a vehicle that's got 225,000 miles on, and I, I still spend money to keep that thing going because I'm not willing to spend the money to get a new vehicle. So I'm cheap. I really enjoy beating the system. You know, the system where you take it into the dealer, and they charge you an arm and a leg, and maybe another leg, to get something fixed. Man, when I fix something, I repair it, I restore it, whatever, man, I'm on cloud nine. Aha! I beat you! I win! I beat the system! I love YouTube, right? We're talking about technology this morning. I love YouTube. There's nothing I can't fix. That's not necessarily true. There's always that uh, possibility that I can't fix it. But what makes me so happy when I've restored something or repaired something is that it's, it's like it's new again. It's made new. Um, this past week, I was working on my son-in-law's car, and it was a Honda. It's the first time I've ever worked on a Honda. Being a Chrysler guy, I don't like working on foreign vehicles. Um, but... We, we started looking, he found out prices, it was gonna be five, six hundred dollars for him to repair his car. We found a starter for $89, we did it ourselves. we were done for $89, and I pushed it onto him, I said, isn't that great? Man, we beat the system. But we repaired it, and it ran, it started like new, and that's awesome. And we see the same thing, as, as what I was working on these things and thinking about today, we see the same thing in our Savior. He likes to repair things. Right? How many of you have seen repair through Jesus Christ? Yes. He likes to repair things. He likes to repair relationships. He likes to repair loneliness. He likes to repair hurting souls, hurting families. He likes to repair things from our past. You can fill in the blank of all the things that he likes to repair that you've seen. We know Jesus came to serve, and he came as part of God's great repair plan. What a plan that is. However, he is different from me, because I do it because I'm cheap. He didn't do it because he was cheap. Actually, it's just the opposite. He was willing to pay everything, everything. For us, he spared no expense for us when he put his and allowed his son to hang on that cross for our sins. Praise God that he was not cheap. I want us to remember that that he repairs. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24 it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. And he restores. In 1 Peter 5.10, he says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. We celebrate his death on a cross every Sunday. He is a great mechanic. He is a wonderful, wonderful repairman. And we celebrate that when we take communion on Sunday. In Matthew chapter 26, I got to get my cup open here. 
That's the drop the mic right there. I hope it's easier for you than it is for me. There we go. In Matthew 26, he says, While they were still eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. In verse 27, he says, Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you, many, for many, for forgiveness of the sins. Take and drink. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this time, this opportunity we have uh, to hear your word. Father, help, help us to apply these things uh, that were spoken of this morning to our lives. Uh, Father, almost everybody has some type of addiction, some type of something that rules them, that masters their lives. And we pray, Father, that as Christians, as we seek your glory, as we seek to know you more, to live as you want us to live, Father, that we take these things into account and that we correct them and we follow you. God, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this time and this opportunity we have to lift our voices to you, to lift our prayers, our concerns, and we just praise you, Father. We pray for Marilyn Stokes this morning. We pray that you would be with her as her leg and knee um, heals from the fall. And we just pray, Father, that you be with Dave as he takes care of her. We just uh, are so thankful uh, for them and, and the way they serve uh, this church. Uh, Father, we lift up David Eikenberry to you as well as he continues to heal from his surgery. We just ask that you'd watch over him. There's so many things that we can lift up in prayer, Father. You know those needs, you know those concerns, and we place them in your hand. We praise your name, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. You all have a great week, and we'll see you next week. Have it open next time. <laughs> <It's done. laughs>